What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Bobby Dizzle Podcast. I know it's been a couple of weeks since my last episode, but I've got a good one for you this week. Comedian Jen Fulweiler joined me from Austin. She was nice enough to take a few minutes out of her time last week to talk, sit down on Zoom with me. Uh, we discussed comedy, uh, her radio radio career, and her book, Your Blue Flame. So uh, it's going to be a great episode. You guys are going to enjoy it. A um, couple of uh, bookkeeping things here, as they call it. If you want to like, comment, and subscribe, and... Uh, well, like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to subscribe to my social media, follow me on social media, and subscribe to the feeds on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, what have you. They're all on bobbydizzle.com. Just check that out. And that's where I put my new uh, episodes as well. So all things Bobby Dizzle are on bobbydizzle.com subsequently. So without further ado, here's Jen Fulweiler. Let's do this. my pro mic to give you some better sound i appreciate you being here i know you're yeah this is great i'm so glad to do it i said i would uh reach out for the favor of being a thousandth viewer thousand yeah viewer. yeah no this is great it's a fun way to connect with new people i love it oh yeah and also read this book uh it told me to try to fail so oh nice good <laughs> right right i know and it's funny a lot of times things will work out when you're trying to fail yeah it did uh tried the stephen king approach with the uh the nail and yes first one yes. went through right it's amazing amazing how that works it's pretty uh it's pretty amazing how it works when you try and you're like oh these guys will never say yes well crap now i'm committed i know <laughs> i know yeah i've gotten in over my head many times because i was just sure that i would get a rejection and then i was like oh i never planned for, <laughs> i never planned for them to say yes now i don't know what to do yeah the, the last time that happened uh the audio failed using skype so that was kind of never recovered from that one yeah yeah <laughs> yep but uh, yeah, I think we've tweeted tweeted around before. I was the guy who said, "Come for the seven thousand dollars, seven hundred dollars sweater, stay for oh, the last." Oh, that was yeah. you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, absolutely. So and so I you... take it, are you in Alabama? I guess mm -hmm. by your hat. Yeah. Now, I could say Arkansas and make a joke. Yeah, it's Alabama. Oh, Huntsville. is it Huntsville. okay? Yeah. <laughs> you well, should come great. over here. We got a um, new comedy club, fairly new. Oh, what's it called? Uh, Stand up live. Oh, I need. Well, I'm doing a. In the fall, I'm doing a club tour. So, um, so uh, yeah, maybe that'll be, we'll have to check that out. I'll have to keep that in mind because I am, we are hitting comedy clubs right now. How, how was Tampa for you there? It was great. The club was in a, a part of town that was hard for my people to get to. So it, it was a weird thing where it was a lot of fun and I enjoyed it, but it was definitely hard for my fans to make it out because it was in one of those party districts where there's no parking anywhere and it's, everyone's out partying and madness and you know the suburban moms had uh you know they i think that wasn't as much their scene but they did have fun and it was a great crowd and we really enjoyed it yeah i've wondered that about your demographic how that mixed with the comedy scene it's it's uh, a slog for sure they definitely show up better to theaters mm -hmm. but there's also an advantage of just getting me known in the comedy world um it just it helps me network a little bit to do these clubs and then once i work out my material we'll uh i'll head back to um to theaters as well how, how long have you been working on your material before you started the tour i know some i hear some comedians talk about two years and about 10 years yeah. prior i i have a system for getting it done faster um so i do what i call garage comedy where i get neighbors and, and people from my neighborhood and i actually give them sheets to fill out where they give me written feedback on my set and it cuts my time in half so but so it takes about probably about two or three months to write and then to take you have to test in front of real audiences i can't just do the garage thing and so maybe another two or three months of testing in the clubs because that that's what a comedy club tour is for typically if you can do theaters you do theaters mm -hmm. but the reason sometimes you'll see a nate bargetsy or a jim gaffigan go to your local comedy club is it's a more informal setting. Mm -hmm. And so it allows you to play around with your material. It doesn't have to be perfectly polished. And um, and so so probably six months total before I have a, a full um, real set that I, I could film a special with. Okay, yeah. Has some really good Toyota Sienna jokes. Oh yeah, really, yeah, yeah, really, yeah, really yeah hit of course. Home. Of nice course. little pocket for your dreams over here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's that's always a hit. That's one of my backups if I'm testing out new material yeah. and it's not working. 
I'll go into those jokes because I know those will be a hit. That is a good one. Um, it really hit on with us because my wife keeps her whooping spoon in that little dream. Oh, book. yeah. Oh, yeah. See, that's what, and you need that, man, with these kids. And I wish they had a limo screen where you could just roll that up and then you can't hear the kids anymore. Oh, yeah. It's basically the um, mom equivalent to a pump shotgun. Right, right. Isn't it? I know. I know. Yep. Yep. Anyway, something else I was going to ask you, I, I follow your podcast and I've been listening to you since probably as long as Lino since you used to come on before him. Yeah. With your um, name that tune show. Yeah. I can't think of what it was called. I th- uh, oh. oh, wait, uh, Jen's Jukebox. Yeah, yeah. Jen's Jukebox. Yeah, and, yeah. and it got cut down to 30 seconds because of I the- know. Yeah. And then I couldn't really do it because I, I couldn't talk over the, the music. Yeah. It really took the, sweeped your knees off from you with that. I know. Well, I just had to do other things on Friday. Yeah, that was tough. So what, um, you were there, how, you were there for how long? You quit 2020. I was, I started in 2014. Yeah, it was. So six years. So about midway through Lino's little career there. Right, right. Yeah, but I kind of, yeah, he's, and he's still there doing a great job. And um, yeah, so I was just kind of there, there in the middle. He's got the best online podcast studio I've ever seen as far as lighting goes, I think. No kidding. I know. And he put a lot of work into that and it looks amazing. I told him when he was putting it together, he would text me pictures of the different lighting Mm -hmm. setup. And I'd say, wow, that is, that is a really nice looking studio. He's he's got the best one I've ever seen. I'm talking about across the board. Yeah, I know. I know it really came together. I, and I think it was kind of a a stressful process for him, but I told him, uh, that it, I mean, you really pulled that off. It really came together. Yeah, I was, I I asked him what it was on, you know, he responds to to the uh, comments. He goes, well, I don't know what it is. I just set it up. I'm like, yeah, right. (laughs) Come on, we know. You know exactly. You probably got the, the sheets right in front of you. What's on there? Yeah. No, yeah. Tyler didn't do it. Yeah. And by the way, Lino is so sweet. He might, if you asked him to be on the podcast, he he's one, he's another one. You might be surprised. He might say yes. I was I was gonna try for it. I messaged Tyler on Facebook like five years ago for something, yeah. and I figured that was kind of a dead end. I would just ask Lino directly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he That's might. A, you never know. Well, it's kind of a dead end. Um, what it would it feel like to put your two week in? I know I do it every couple of years, but right, a two week to your career. Yeah, it was, uh, it was four weeks and I gave them four weeks notice. And that was, it was very hard because I did, I like it. I, I wasn't leaving the job because I didn't like it. Oh, no. It was just, it, it just felt like it was the right time to have more of my time back to focus on comedy. It, you know, if, if I hadn't had six kids, I probably would have stayed at that job, but um, it, it, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day and it, I was just running out of time to do comedy and radio and you know be there when my family needed me to be there and um so it, it was very hard because it feels like a breakup you know it's yeah. I I had to do with my bosses I had to do that it's not you it's me conversation <laughs> the and, and uh-huh the George Costanza right right and and uh and and, and again it was uh, there was no there was nothing wrong it was just it was just time for me to move on but I knew that that would cause them a lot of work to replace me. And I, I knew that this was a big inconvenience for them and they didn't want me to leave. And, and so it was one of the hardest things I've ever done professionally was making those calls. Yeah, I can imagine, especially that, that high level. I put, yeah. it in, I put it in for jobs where I just like two or three people, but man, this is awful. Yeah. <laughs> can't imagine a career ending. Um, but you did have, you kind of had a stroke of luck with Joe Rogan moving right down the street. I know. Right. And he brought his whole squad. And yeah, I mean, I was uh, I was at a comedy club the other day and he just stopped by for the heck of it and did Mm -hmm. a surprise set. He's he is all over. It it is very easy to run into Rogan at the at the Austin comedy scene. I can't imagine how how big is Austin. We just got back from Dallas. But like, I, you know, Dallas is one of those cities kind of like mini New York. So I don't know how big Austin is. I know how big Huntsville is. Austin is much smaller. Uh, I'm trying to think, I, I'm, I don't know the exact population, but it is definitely smaller than half the size of a Houston or a Dallas. Okay. I, I imagine it's kind of like Huntsville. It's kind of, they call it us the Pentagon of the South. Yeah. yeah. Of well, and whatnot. Austin is now the Los Angeles mm-hmm. of the South. When you meet new people in Austin, everyone just assumes that you're from LA. I mean, everyone in Austin now is from LA. You don't, you don't even meet people from Texas or not even from New York. I mean, the, it seems like the entire state of California has just moved to Austin. And so that's a, that's a big cultural shift. I've been in this area 
for a couple of decades. And, um, you know, there are pros and cons. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just weird that especially in the comedy scene, when people mm -hmm. meet me, because they know I've been doing comedy for a little while, a lot of times they will ask me what part of LA I'm from <laughs> when they meet me here in Austin. It never occurs to them that I might be from Austin. Well, what was the scene there before that? I mean, there had to be a little bit of comedy. Just yeah, yeah, there was, there, was a, there was a good comedy scene here before. It was just different uh, because a lot of the major talent agencies aren't based here. You had a little bit more of an informal scene in Austin, but it was respected. There were very, very talented comics here. It, there just wasn't as much of an industry presence here. And now that's kind of changing. Oh yeah, now it's like a Mecca. Yeah, 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 it is. That's one of the things when you say, why did, why was I told to quit during a pandemic at this time? And, and when comedy was basically nothing aside from the TikToks, I'm always like screaming at the radio because Rogan just moved there. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he convinced so many other people like Tom Segura and Christina P. And a lot of people with a lot of influence joined him and, and moved down here as well. They're doing a lot of stuff. The What do they do, the tailgate tours where they got in a stage in a field and drive, drive in? Yeah, yeah. I guess they don't have to do that anymore now that yeah. now that COVID has kind of passed, but or at least the lockdowns have passed. But yeah, I mean, they were, they stayed creative through the whole pandemic. I know he woke up Ron Watt to yeah. get back on the scene. He was, he was about to quit. Yeah. He was ready yeah, to I know. Well, right. And now I, I guess I'm trying to think of when that was a friend of mine was just at a comedy club a few weeks ago mm -hmm. and Ron just stopped by and did a set. It was like the Rogan surprise set. No one knew he was going to be there and he just jumped up and did 20 minutes and it was such a delight. Yeah, he's he's changed so much since when I was in college back in like 04. He looks like a different person. Yeah, I know. I know. He got the hair slicked back and the little glasses. He used to be this redneck dude. Now he's. Yeah, he has a totally different look. Sand. It's funny how some comedians can change their look and it really changes how you interpret their comedy. I don't know if you've ever seen Nate Bargetsy before he had a beard. He just, it's like watching two different comics. And what's crazy is I've seen him tell the same jokes with and without the beard and the jokes land totally differently depending on his appearance he's been around a while yeah 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 he's Never. been out there i and it's he's one of those people it's so great to watch him find success and and really become a household name he's one of the good guys who really deserves it yeah his, his deadpan humor will have you breathing into a sack oh it's, yeah oh, oh. Like, come on his, man. you gotta stop his i mean i love all of his specials and albums but his comedy album yelled at by a clown um <laughs> i i laugh until i cry it ruins my eye makeup I, i've listened to the thing 10 times and i still laugh until i cry every time i listen to it when when you know you know he's flipped through netflix and it comes up on a special and it tells yeah. like the funniest joke when he has the one about he takes takes his shirt off the trunk of his car and his old lady th old man thinks it's his wife yeah that's oh <laughs> that's right that's right oh yeah yeah and it's and it's like a thinks it's his 60 year old wife said, yeah yeah olivia yeah. He goes, yeah, who's right. that sadder for, yes. me or Olivia? Yes, yes. I did. And, <laughs> and someone else could tell that exact same joke and it wouldn't be nearly as funny, mm -hmm. but there's just something about Nate's accent and his delivery that you're just screaming. You're just screaming when he tells these stories. He's from just a couple hours away from here. Oh, really? Yeah, he's not from far away. Oh, that, that kind of makes it. Yeah, you have a similar accent, actually. I just noticed yeah, that. If I'm not deadpan, unless I'm half asleep. Yeah, right. <laughs> It's weird. Mine was much more, uh, I guess you'd say backwoods until I started working out of college with people that came from all over the place. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've started enunciating different stuff. Like, That's not even me. Yeah. It's something from 20 years ago. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I know what, I listen to a lot of comedy. That's most like a genre I grew up doing. And everybody says, were you influenced by like Pryor and uh, guys, guys similar to that? Yeah, you're... of course. You know, I used to listen to those guys mm -hmm. back in the day. Um, I think I have been most influenced by the really understated deadpan comics, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, Gaffigan's very deadpan, oh, yeah. Nate's very deadpan, and obviously enormous respect for Pryor and, um, you know, Eddie Murphy and those guys, you know, they, they really paved the way in this industry and they're as talented as it gets. I, I think maybe it's because as a woman, and you know, given the persona and the demeanor I have, there's not a lot that there's not a lot of overlap between what Eddie Murphy could <laughs> do and say and and have that work and me. Um, obviously, I look like a, a very uptight white woman, 
And so that sort of understated kind of humor tends tends to come be better coming from me. And so I like I like some of those comics from back in the day as a fan, but in terms of informing and inspiring my own work, I tend to go for for more of the the sort of understated humor uh, comedians. Okay, I was hoping you'd answer something like that because you know you're not as obviously not dirty like Pryor right. or Eddie Murphy have a coke and a smile. Yeah, um, but you're obviously not Kathleen Manigan or some of the uh, Whitney Cummings. Mm-hmm. That's that's not the same genre. So I was hoping it was something right in there because it seemed more seemed more deadpan, dry humor than that. You know the raunchy stuff that sometimes right. not, is not really as funny as it is dirty. Yeah, and it, the other thing is it's a little bit difficult for me to find people to be inspired by because there are so few female comics mm-hmm. who are out there doing great work that that actually gets you to laugh. You know, it's really laugh out loud funny, and who keep it clean. That is that is not a big field yeah. that is clean, out there. Clean thing is not out there. Yeah, I almost want to sacrifice it though because Eliza, she's not, she's dirty. Yeah, you're she, right. You know, Eliza's pretty clean. Yeah, you're right, and she's great. Um, and also, uh, you know, who's blowing up right now is Leanne Morgan. I mean, she always had a solid career, but she reached some tipping point a, a year or two ago. And suddenly, I mean, she, she sold out the Ryman in Nashville, I think twice over. Um, so mm-hmm. it, it's just been so fun to watch her. Cause I, I discovered her as she was first taking off a couple of years ago, even though again, she'd had a tremendous reputation in the field. I I'd heard of her, but I just didn't, I hadn't seen her comedy until a couple of years ago. And it's really fun to watch her just it, kind of reach the, the height of success. And that, and she's, I think she's friends with Nate Bargatze and they're from the same area. Mm-hmm. And it's really great to see all those guys do well. I was going to say they're East Tennessee as well. Yeah. Yeah. He had a show with, was it Reno Collier? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, yeah. I get him yeah. and that John Capillary guy mixed up. Mixed yeah. Up. I, 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 like. <laughs> I see how that could happen. Yeah. yeah. That's just me being, seeing all white people look alike. Right. But yeah, Kathleen, she's been around what 20 years. Or or Leanne, yeah. Leanne not Kathleen, Leanne oh, yeah. Morgan. She sounds like my relatives, all of them. I know oh. she has that very distinct accent that's so listenable and it's just it's just so easy on the ear. Oh yeah, talking about her husband moving her into a trailer park. Yeah. And yeah. having to do dirty things to buy their kids clothes and yep. <laughs> dude, yep. I, start throwing, I have to do dirty things. My my baby needs no new shoes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what's interesting is how many comedians have a distinct regional accent. I mean, of course, there are comedians who who have more of a just a mainstream, unidentifiable, like you can't tell what part of the country they're from. But so many people who have breakout success, they have a distinct accent, whether it's a Brooklyn accent or a, a, a heavy Southern accent, or even Gaffigan has kind of a Midwestern, um, you know, where they're from Milwaukee or something. He, he has that kind of accent. And uh, I always find that interesting that I, I think that part of why people gravitate toward comedy is they they like, they, they want that feeling of, I know that guy, or I know this woman, like, yep, pe- people like her are exactly like that. That's so true, that, that feeling of familiarity. And if you have a more standard accent where people can't tell where you're from, they just have trouble placing you. Like, who is this person? Like, wh- where is this person from? I, I just can't tell. Yeah, look at look at Bill Burr. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> that's a yeah. prime example. Yeah, they're yeah. all and um, on that same vein, like Larry the Cable Guy has the accent, but it's not real. Oh, is that? Yeah, I didn't. I guess I knew that, but I had forgotten that. That's yeah, interesting. He, he kind yeah. of phones it in a little bit. If you ever watch like his documentaries where he's like a Mike Rowe wannabe kind of thing. Yeah, he sounds. He's from Nebraska. Yeah, actually, so I knew he sounds that like that. I was just yeah. in Omaha. Yeah, yeah, and they were talking about. I forgot about that. And yeah. I know someone who has a comedian friend. He He's not super well-known. I forget his name, but he's doing very well. He's probably going to break out. And she was saying that he'd had no success, no success. And he had a, a standard, just no identifiable accent, but he was from Wisconsin. And, and then he intentionally really put on the Wisconsin accent and, and really exaggerated it. And suddenly he was so much more successful. He got many more bookings. His videos got more views. It, it worked a lot better for him. I imagine so. Cause that's, that's one of those people almost as ashamed of as having a Southern accent. Yeah. That's made fun of. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That layer of the cable guy thing. You go back and watch some of his earlier days and he's in a windbreaker. I know that is right. tragic to watch. Right. Another thing. Um, 
back to the, I was going to go back to the book. I got a notes here. Very All right, great. Um, the questionnaire on the, cause we're, we were, I was looking at the time. It was like the questionnaire about the uh, blue flame. I never could figure out what mine was. I had like four things. I can see the traveling it's making prank phone calls. <laughs> right. And that's I'm one like, of mine. Yeah. I'm like, why was it look for things you did when you were young, uh, make prank phone calls. I love doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I was the pro. I was the best. And, and one of the things I did every day for like four hours, every summer, sit at this old store and talk to these old men for like four hours about their stories of World War II. And I think that has a lot to do with the reason I started like in, I became a history minor because I would sit in these history classes and just suck in all these stories. I'm like, I wonder if that has something to do with the blue flame. I was writing it down. I bet I've taken it 15 times. Well, it's interesting too, that you're, you're a podcaster yeah. now and you, and you love sitting and talking to those mm -hmm. guys. And now that's what you do through podcasting. Oh, I, was, I, I fell in love with podcasting. Like I, I took some kind of serum. Yeah. Like I, I went well, that's through, what it is. Dad, but you see that connection to talking to the World War II guys mm -hmm. and what you do with podcasting. It's, it's really the same thing. And one of my episodes is a guy that was in World War II. I reached out and found him. Yeah. He's yeah. Like 99 years old. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's it. I think it's, it's conversation and it's learning about other people and their stories, whether mm -hmm. it's talking to World War II vets or reading a history book about some other time period and then sharing it with other people. Oh, it's great. Yeah. That and the, um, that and traveling seem to be a new thing. Cause I always like, um, I always said I like to canoe and go four wheeler riding, but it's really just the new trails I like. Yeah. We just got yeah. back from, we just got back from Yellowstone and that was like a drug to me for like 10 days straight. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. I was like, that's gotta be part of it. I was, I was checking right. stuff off, making notes. Yeah. But yeah, and, I, I think it seems like the, the podcasting is really, um, seems like there's a lot you can do with that. It's a, it's a medium. that's pretty malleable. Yeah. Right. It, you can either make a video out of it or just make it your logo and just talk over it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I always wanted to have a hunting show back in high school, back <laughs> in, in high school and college. I changed my major from computer, computer science to uh, broadcasting. Yeah. I'm writing screenplays and everything. And I couldn't, I didn't want to make the traditional hunting show because those are kind of boring. You know, right. a dude whispering to you on a Saturday right. night. <laughs> then I started watching Rogan and Cam Haynes. And I'm like, that's it. That's what I want to do. Yeah. So I kind of just kind of planned all that out. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah. And, and that's the, and that's the great thing about using your talents is you can take something, take that genre of hunting or whatever, and then spin it to put your own unique spin on it. And that's mm -hmm. a really powerful thing. Yeah. It's, it's been pretty neat so far, even though I want to do all formats, everybody's like, what's your, yeah. what's your format? I don't have a format. Yeah. I, uh, I just wanted to, I just want to do things like, I, cause it's a, any one of the catchphrases anything to satisfy my nat like reflex uh nat like attention span yeah <laughs> that was my tagline you know i think a lot of us who do this kind of work i have a little bit of adhd probably mm -hmm. undiagnosed oh i need i need adderall bad i can't do yeah. it. like i'm so scatterbrained uh-huh me too me get, too can't sit down for very long right totally. i just just setting this up was like come on it was, i'm done now i know get distracted I'm over here on Facebook and you ding it in. I'm so, oh man, what is I do that. I know. <laughs> and I always have 50 things going on at once and I'm jumping from, I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll do this. Yeah, totally. Well, at least I'm not alone. Right. I, and another, uh, another thing about not being alone was the uh, chapter that I, I was going to read is my wife's book. She bought it from me and yeah. gave it to me and I started reading it. And part about the dirty house, I'm like, we have a dirty house. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I that, said, there's yep, a chance. That's my house. Yeah. I said, there's a chance. So we have a dirty house. Yeah. Very relatable. Very relatable. Anyway, yeah, yeah I was going to, mm -hmm, I was going to just reach back out to you and see how everything was going and, uh, you know, cash in, cash in the favor for the yes. first 1,000th listener. Or Happy 1, to do it. Review. Yeah. So I'll let you go. Uh, I was going to give you a chance to tell everybody uh, how they can find you and where you're headed. Yeah. So uh, you can look me up Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok is, is a big new thing. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm Oddly enough, TikTok is now my most popular platform. I'm kind it of is. exploding there, which is a lot of fun. Just search for my name, uh, Jen Fulweiler, and that, people have trouble spelling that. But if you can get Jen and then the F-U-L, it'll probably mm. suggest me because I've got a lot of traction on this platform. So just do your best to search. My latest book is called Your Blue Flame, Drop the Guilt and Do What Makes You Come Alive. So yeah, just look me up wherever. All right, yeah, I forgot about the TikTok thing. Because I was, but I really want to get it out uh, so everybody can find you because my 27 followers are really thirsty for new yeah, material. Yeah, 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 good. <laughs> and 
you're gonna be a big hit in the Bobby Dizzle community. Yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, I am TikTok famous, so that yeah. Was... So that will be exciting for them to find out about me. What was the first one? The uh, what was her name? The Justice, Supreme Court Justice. Oh yeah, yeah. That went mega viral. That was when I dressed up as Amy Coney Barrett, and at yeah, that that's who it was. video of the guy. So yeah. So for people who didn't see it, there was a viral video of a guy skateboarding and he's just being really chilled out and he's he's doing a Fleetwood Mac song and he just pulls up a, a whole container <laughs> of like a, a liter container of ocean spray cranberry juice and sips it. And for some reason th that went mega viral. And then Amy Coney Barrett got confirmed, you know, to great controversy <laughs> right after that. And so I dressed up as her. I got a wig that was just like her in judges robes and everything. And I made it look like I was skateboarding I was actually on the back of a pickup truck but I made it look like I was skateboarding and then I lifted up and st it was an ocean spray bottle but I wrote over the the label haters tears and it had clear liquid <laughs> in it and I drank that that I mean that was everywhere that went mega viral yeah it's still blowing up isn't it I've saw I know it, it well yeah yeah absolutely I, I still that, get a lot of views to that yeah that and the uh kids screaming on an airplane yeah Oh man, that one, that was on the front page of Fox News, front page of Good Morning America, Yahoo News, Yahoo Sports, the big Australian news outlet covered it, Newsweek covered it. I mean, I got, I got, and, and then a, a, the sketch I did after that about being a traditional mother, that was uh, on the homepage of the Today Show. I mean, it's crazy the, the media coverage I'm getting from this stuff. It's funny, I had a formal career at Sirius XM, never got media coverage. And now I mess around on social media and I've got Fox News, Newsweek, the Today Show, Good Morning America talking about what I do. It's wild. You just tell where everybody's eyes are at. Yeah, right. I, right. Think, I think people are adhering to that baby thing because we just took the our youngest one, she's just a year old, you know, all the way across the country and people are actually helping out. Like, hey, how you yeah. doing? Like, that's hey, nice. I was like, you read the you read the article. That's not yeah, right, right. Yeah. That, I influenced them. That was all me. That was you're, all me. You're an influencer. Yeah. Just don't start selling those TikTok pants. That's weird. I know, right? Yeah, those are a little, yeah. Them I'll, I'll leave that to the kids. <laughs> well, all right. I'll uh thank you for uh coming on here and maybe one day in the future when you'll see my name, like I know him. Yes, I know. Remember <laughs> me. Remember me when you're beating Rogan in the podcast and you get a hundred and fifty million dollar Spotify deal. Just remember me. Give me a shout out. I'll throw you a crust, crust of bread like Peter. Thank you. I appreciate days. that. Yeah, All right. Well, have a good you. day and a good weekend. Okay. And I look yeah, forward take to care. listening appreciate to your stuff. Okay. All right. Bye.